Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Available on Apple Podcasts and Podcast One. Welcome, you're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, Tim Dennis. Another week come and gone, folks. Thank you for hanging in and being a part of this with us. We have our app up now in the iTunes store. If you didn't know about it, go look up the Darkness Radio app. It's free, it's easily accessible, and it will give you uh, ways to communicate and connect with all of our shows. We are aware that there are still a few bugs and uh, our our programmer will be back in town on Monday. <clears throat> They'll be working on it and trying to uh, clean things up a little bit. So just bear with us. Most of the uh, items are working well. I think it's the Legends podcast button. When you click it, it'll take you in. And when you click to play, it'll actually crash the app. So that will be fixed really soon. But you should still have access to this podcast, uh, also to Midnight in the Desert Live, um, and then you can subscribe and get the podcast. For those of you that have been patiently awaiting the iTunes app, it is out. It is available. And yes, there is one in the Google Play Store for all of you Droid users. It's been out there for years. It's available. Go check it out for yourself. Let's get started, shall we? Uh, our guest joining us tonight has a new book called Lying Wonders strangest things michael brown our guest mr brown thank you so much for joining us today dave thanks for having me you've got 29 books that's that's pretty astounding how how long have you been writing uh, i wrote my first book in uh in 1976 um i was in my early 20s it was a book about uh, psychokinesis psychic phenomena and uh, some of the books are smaller than others. Some are pretty thick. But, uh, yeah, I've been at it uh, as a full-time book author for, for quite a while now. And, uh, and uh, a variety, everything kind of from investigative uh, journalism about uh, concerning the mafia and subjects like that to psychic phenomena. And now I focus on supernatural and paranormal phenomena. That's great. What what started your interest in examining the supernatural and paranormal? Well, Dave, I've been interested in things like UFOs since I was a kid. When I when I was in uh, junior high school, I remember reading books by a radio broadcaster, Frank Edwards, uh, including a famous book of his called Stranger Than Science, and re- I read that, reread it, and it was really a compilation of the strangest stories he could find or he'd heard about uh, uh, anywhere. And some of them were not supernatural. They may have had to, to do with the intelligence of animals or incredible coincidences and strength and so forth. But a lot of them were supernatural and covered everything from Bigfoot and, and uh, Mothman to, to the uh, uh, UFO, an alien-type thing, Loch Ness Monster, and ghost curses and so forth. Um, I decided to uh, to do an update on that after 60 years, and not only an update, but uh, I think with even stranger stories uh, from that whole panoply, that gamut of various oddities and, and extraordinary happenings that you can find around the, the world, and I put it together for this book, Lying Wonders, Strangest Things. Is there a specific aspect of the supernatural that fascinates you most? Well, I've written a couple books on near-death experiences, um, even going back to the 1970s when I was a Cub newspaper reporter, or started out as a newspaper reporter. Um, I did stories about alleged haunted houses, ghosts, um, I used to hear ghost stories on New Year's Eve from my grandmother and so forth. I, I think that piqued my interest. 
And, and you know, I've always, well, I've written about uh, other things for sure, um, including science, books that have to do with science and genetics and toxic waste and everything else. I always um, kept my ear to the rail when it came to the paranormal. And, uh, this, and uh, for the last 19 years, I've had a website that's focused totally on, on the spiritual. It's called spiritdaily.com. And a lot of it has to do with supernatural phenomena around the world of various uh, kinds. So, um, you know, any anything of that sort is just of an interest to me and has been for just about my entire life. In looking back at your life, have you had paranormal experiences happen in or around you, or has has it just been a fascination? Oh, I've had my share. Um, I I don't know uh, where to where to start. When I was doing the the book on on uh, psychic phenomena, it was a book called PK, a report on psychokinesis. It's actually it was came out in 1976. It was the first book ever written solely on psychokinesis uh, in a popular way. Um, when I was writing that book, I was naive enough to go into haunted houses and to mess around with, uh, with mediums and, and uh, Ouija boards and things of that nature. And I had an, any number of experiences. Um, I remember going into one place in Binghamton, New York. I think it was on a street they call Oak Street and, and, uh, street, and we were messing around with the Ouija board because this place was supposed to have a spirit. And something was spelling things out. I don't know if it was just our subconscious moving the the uh, the pointer around to various you know letters and, and numbers or whatever it was. But uh, all of a sudden, the room got extraordinarily cold, and we went over to look at the thermostat. Uh, it had it had indeed dropped. It was in I think like in the fifties, um, and all of a sudden, I felt something just lift me up quickly, and whisk me across the room off my feet. And uh, the fr- uh, a friend of mine who was doing research alongside me, he was an associate professor at State University of New York in Binghamton, he said I was literally off my feet uh, and, uh, across the, the living room. Uh, so, you know, you mess around. Well, I, that's why I say naive, because I used to think that these things were just the power of the mind, that psychokinesis, that it was the power of the mind. And, uh, you know, I wasn't uh, concerned with uh, evil spirits because I figured that, uh, that they were, that I didn't, well, first of all, I didn't know anything about evil spirits. I, I figured, well, maybe there's a devil but he's busy with Linda Blair. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was, <laughs> I, I was going into this blinders on, and I paid quite a price for that. I, I had many, many things happen to me um, through the years. And well, do you, do you I, believe that that was something evil in the sense of what we would consider demonic, or do you believe it was just an angry spiritual force? Well, I, you know, I, I, in, that, in that case, I don't know. I know in some cases I have a strong opinion it was a evil force, but I also believe that there are uh, discarnate spirits, that there are disembodied uh, spirits, that there are, are souls that wander about in an earthbound state. Um, they haven't gone to the other side. They haven't gone into the light. And they're overly attached to a thing or a person, uh, to a house. That's why we get things that go bump in the night, uh, I, they're obsessed with something or else they're fearful of going into the light that we hear about uh, from near-death experiences, you know, on the other side. Um, they're around and some are nicer than others. You, you know, you, when, you, when you die, in my opinion, you have the same personality. And if there are things to clean up then and they're not cleaned up, then you can cause people... Uh, around you some problems if you're attached to them or to the place they're living in. So uh, I I certainly think it can be that, although I think in many cases that it is, in fact, demonic uh, spirits, and I think they're very, very adept at masquerading as spirits of the deceased. So 
you have to be extremely cautious and messing around with things like the Ouija board, going to seances, channeling are, uh, as far as I'm concerned, pure danger. When you get flung across the room, now, if we look at this realistically, how far, I mean, was this like you got knocked over and fell a few feet? Did you, was this horror movie time and you were launched a good six, seven feet across the room? What can you describe to us about that? You mean the, the case in Binghamton? Yes. Um, uh, no, I mean, that was probably a good, let me see, the room, it was a pretty sizable room. I would say that, uh, that I, for about 10 feet, uh, where my feet were not uh, touching the ground, and I was just kind of whisked, um, it, just in, in real quick motion, but he, right in front of him, and I knew what was happening. I was fully aware it was happening. Uh, another another time with him, we were investigating a, quote, haunted, unquote, uh, apartment, and uh, once again, messing around with the Ouija board, we figured we, we would uh, be able to determine what was behind the alleged haunting by using a Ouija board and, uh, and stuff, stuff started happening there. And I decided now, to, when, to stay over. If, if I could ask, when you say you're mm-hmm. messing with the Ouija board, can you go into that a little bit more detailed? What exactly were you doing and what was being well, communicated? Who, well, who's here? You know, is, is somebody here who's haunting this place? You know, what's your name? In the case of that apartment, I, I don't remember what it said. I know that at one time... Oh, it so it's just the basic questions. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Uh, and I stayed overnight in that place. Um, stayed on the couch. And in the middle of the night, I woke up. And there was just... There was something right on top of me. I was paralyzed. You know how when you put a nine, uh, one of those nine-volt batteries against your tongue, you feel that tingling on your tongue? Right. I don't know if you ever did that when you oh, were sure. a kid. Yeah. Well, uh that's how my whole body felt. And, and, and I couldn't move. I, I tried to scream, tried to shout. I couldn't. And there was something, uh, uh, on top of me in this, in this apartment. So this is why I say these things are, that's not exactly a pleasant experience. And I don't think it, I don't think it indicates a positive spirit. So, uh, you have to be uh, very careful with, with this stuff. It's fascinating. It's quote fun unquote, but, uh, uh, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't do it all over again. I wouldn't do all that over again. I'd be were much these more spirits careful. were these spirits threatening in nature in their in their um, communication through the Ouija board, or would they lure you in and then all hell would break loose? Well, that's you know it's a very perceptive question, and and uh, and it's the it's it's the the latter. Um, there weren't threats; they were just. You know, they would answer questions, pretend to be, let's say, uh, a, you know, an old king or something, or uh, somebody who lived in the house, uh, whatever, you know. Um, and I also, when I lived in, I, I lived in Manhattan for quite a while as a freelance uh, book writer and journalist, Um and when I was there, even though I was writing about other things, I mentioned the book on the mafia. I was I, uh, I wrote the first book on toxic waste, Love Canal, those type things. Even though I was doing uh, secular work, as I would put it, regular work, non supernatural work, natural work, um, I, I maintained, as I said, a cottage interest in the preternatural, the paranormal, whatever you want to call it. And my agent, my agent actually was my agent's assistant who handled a lot of my work down in uh, the Chelsea area of Manhattan. She, she shared, she was in a townhouse with several other women who were in publishing, some of them. And uh, they, they had all kinds of things that were going on in this old townhouse. So I used to go down there and I was fascinated with it and so forth. And during that period of time, I started to suffer all kinds of maladies, mainly emotional, psychomotive, uh, psychological. And uh, I actually had a dream during that uh, whole time that uh, kind of jolted me out of those types of investigations because it was a real red uh, warning signal flashing in, in, in front of my face. You know, when I was doing a book in the mafia, 
Dave, I've got to tell you, too, uh, never mind just this stuff that happens in allegedly haunted houses or when we're messing with seances. But I had an interview uh, for this book. It was for Simon & Schuster. I had an interview some heavy-duty gangsters, including spending time weeks with this one guy who had been arrested for for murder. He was hiding out uh, because he had squealed. He was hiding out uh, in Maryland. He was from Jersey, New Jersey, Newark area. And during that time of interviewing him and uh, Hitman and and so forth, uh, I started to encounter supernatural events that reminded me of, of, of what happened in Binghamton. Um, so these type of things don't just come with haunted houses. They come with, uh, with, with evil. They come with negative situations. So you think that by just communicating with these mobsters, these gangsters, any of the negativity, death, and, and evil that they'd done was actually taking form around you? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like I, it, you know, you're around a dog and and, and uh, the fleas can jump uh, off on you if you know if you're rolling around with uh, with something like that, you're going to become infested. Something could attach to you. I I, I believe that that in fact uh, did happen to me. And it was I remember one time I had a I had a uh, a friend of mine uh, who was a detective in the Essex County Special uh, Prosecutors Unit. And he dealt with all the mobsters and so forth. And he had a guy on a street who was still an informant, a guy who had done uh, contract killings, but he was staying on the street as an informant for a while. He was trying to stay out of jail, and that was the deal that he was out there setting. You know how they do; they set people up and so forth. He was he was he wear a wire probably and all that type thing. And he agreed as a favor to my friend, the detective, to take me around Newark area and show me where a lot of bodies had been buried. And uh, he, had, he had done, as they put it, work, un, unquote, you know, hits with the main uh, person I was writing about in my uh, book. So I rode around with him that day in Newark. He had a Furline Mercedes. Even though it was back in the early 80s, he had a, he had a phone in his car. He had, uh, you know, he had a suit on. You could see his... Uh, his uh, biceps through the suit. He was a muscular guy, and he was a mean-looking guy. And I'll just never. The reason I bring him up is that I'll I'll never forget. Even though I wasn't one to be going to church back then, and uh, I remember he would turn when he would turn to me and look at me as we were driving around. There was something in his eyes that was reptilian. There was something that was not human, and I ran across that. With another hit man also who was in a uh, who was in a state penitentiary in he was a he was a real killer down in uh, Texas. There's something that is emanating from them, radiating from them that reminds me again of what I had encountered years before when I was uh, uh, stumbling around haunted houses. Did you ever consider speaking to them and asking if they had? supernatural encounters um i'd just be curious if if you know things that you were picking up on might be haunting them i well i i know the answer to that because the guy i was uh, in one case anyway the guy i was down hiding out with he he had testified against 74 gangsters in the gambino genovese family bruno family a number of families um in the New York City, Philadelphia area. He actually put put away more people in Joe Valachi, even though he wasn't anywhere near as well known. But uh, at any rate, I was down at his hideout with him and his family. And uh, and things happened in their house. Uh, they would tell me uh, stories about things that were occurring. I remember also his daughter's objects were, uh, mentioned to me that small objects would fly across their room. I remember entering one of the rooms upstairs in his house, and and immediately this big painting fell down, crashed from the, the wall. Um, so there, and and I remember he was he was involved in a murder, um, and it was actually somebody who had lived in their house and was like a gopher for them. He was an addict, 
And after this kid was killed, he didn't actually kill him. He was there when, a, when the kid was killed, though they were afraid he was going to squeal on them. Um, so his crew in New, in New Jersey had uh, had murdered him. But uh, he, he appeared in apparition to this gangster's uh, wife. And and uh, a number of things like that uh, occurred uh, while I was in the house, some 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 very strange uh, events and and noises and so forth, or at least fe- certainly feelings, I should say. That has got to be chilling to not only be kind of in the position of hanging out with kind of a heavy hitter, but also surrounded with the strange and the supernatural, all kind of conjoined in that moment. Well, yeah, you know, and. There's a spiritual link because um, I uh, I don't know if I'm going too far with this stuff for your uh, listenership or not. I uh, know we you are know. a strange world paranormal show, so you okay. let us know okay. what you got. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I remember I remember his wife telling me. See, that they had they had uh, killed uh, a guy named uh, Jed, who was um, who they were afraid was going to go to the police about something to keep himself out of a, a drug bust or whatever, and. He used to. He appeared in apparition to this gangster's wife, and he was, he was dripping water, and he had like swampy vegetation on him because they had sunk him in a lake up in the Pocono Mountains in, in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, but it was very interesting because when he was telling, when he was describing the murder to me, which was very hard for him to do because the guy had lived in his house and everything, but. Um, when he was describing the assassination of this kid out in the up in the Poconos, all when he all the time he spoke about the murder, his Doberman Pinscher, which was in the backyard, we were on the second floor. He's telling me the story. That Doberman wailed in the most uncanny, eerie way. I, you know, it certainly couldn't hear us talking. It was it was the middle of the day. There was no reason for it to be howling out there it started howling when we when we began to discuss the murder and it stopped right when we when when we were finished with the description of uh, the murder scene so there were there were there were things like this and it was actually um it was that experience as well as what was going on in my agent's assistant's uh, house that led me to uh to looking at a scans at this type of phenomena. You know, I mean, I did, when I was doing that PK, I interviewed a lot of psychics too. I was at Kent State uh, University's uh, Smith Hall of Physics testing a guy who could raise, levitate uh, a table in a way that clearly was supernatural. And that we showed that right down there in the laboratory. Um, this scientist, this physicist, Dr. Wilbur Franklin, major physicist, he was working with Stanford Research Institute and he had analyzed a a ring that had been deformed by Uri Geller. And, I, you know, I know a lot of people think Uri Geller is just an outright uh, trickster, a fraud uh, showman. And he might be on occasion. But let me tell you something. There are definitely things that happened with Uri Geller that cannot be explained by the amazing Randy or any magician. And I know that from my own personal visit with Uri Geller while I was researching that book on psychokinesis. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a wide range here. If, uh, if you want to know the experience, that uh, the two things that completely convinced me that Uri Geller certainly has supernatural capability, I'll, I'll tell you, but uh, I have to go in a little more detail. And, and like, like I said, I don't know how much detail you want. We hey, we've got uh, you know ninety minutes together, and love to hear stories where people are giving us different aspects of um, what people think they know. So Uri Geller, of course, you know many people have tried to debunk or claim is a fake and a fraud. If you were witness to seeing some of this phenomena, I'd love a firsthand account. So please feel free. Well, let me give you two examples. The the first one is not a, a personal account. The second one will be. Uh, Dr. Wilbur Franklin, this physicist at Kent State, was out in California at, uh, uh, with, with uh, the, the scientist at Stanford Research Institute who was studying Geller. At one point, one of the, they were talking with Geller, and one of the scientists said, took out, 
his uh, his wedding his wedding band, a platinum wedding band. And he said, "Can you do anything with this?" And Geller put his hand over his. He he was holding the ring, not Geller. Put his hand over the scientist own you know clenched fist and when when the scientist then opened it up the ring was split okay now it was fractured this is a platinum ring it's not something you can easily tear apart dr franklin took that ring back to ohio and put it under an electron microscope and he said that the fracture surface in that platinum showed two effects he'd never seen and it could not be duplicated by any known laboratory means, not laser, not even uh, a device that could, that could freeze something. He said that in one part of the fracture surface, there was incipient melting. In other words, the, you know, the atoms that started to melt. In the, right next to it, juxtaposed to it, was an effect of, that, could only, that could only occur um, with absolute zero, temperatures of absolute zero, just the opposite. How could that happen on the same fracture surface? And is anyone seriously going to tell me that a magician could duplicate that? When I went to see, when I was going to see Uri Geller, uh, and I, I, I put pictures of that fracture surface in, in that, that book of mine I mentioned to you, uh, because it was a book really that was written from a journalistic standpoint. When I went to see Eric Geller, before I did, I interviewed Melbourne Christopher. Does that ring a bell to you? It does not. Okay. Melbourne Christopher, he's kind of an old timer, but uh, back in the 70s, he was president of the American uh, Magicians Association. He was also the, known as the foremost expert on, uh, on psychic magic, on, on fake supernatural events he didn't believe in anything supernatural uh i actually met him at the houdini museum in niagara falls ontario and uh, and and i said to him well i'm going to see uri geller i said what should i ask him to do he said i he, he said i'm going to ask he said i'm going to tell you something to do that nobody does with uri geller and that there is absolutely no way he could use trickery there's there's, there's it, he couldn't do it. And I said, well, you know, what's that? He said, well, you're going to go there. Uri Geller is going to say, draw something. And, well, he's got his eyes closed, and he's going to open his eyes, and he's going to draw the same thing. He said, it's obvious he's peeking, reading the top of your pen as you're drawing, even though you don't think he can do it, or somehow it's making an imprint that he can see. He said, instead, instead tell him to send you an image. And so when I went to see Geller, he was living on the Upper East Side of Manhattan at the time. Uh, we sat down and, and, and we were talking about various things. And, and, uh, Geller, and, and I said to Geller, I'd like to do some telepathy. And he said, fine. He says, uh, you want to draw something and see if I can draw it? And I said, no. I said, um, I want you to draw something and send it to me. So and he didn't hesitate. He said, okay. So Geller goes and draws something. I have no idea what it was. I'm just sitting there. He's, then he folds up the paper. He hands it to me. I put it under my leg. I close my eyes, and I immediately saw, as, as, if, I, as if formed with lightning or electrical, some electrical pulse, I saw a, a Christmas tree with three ridges on each side, on the right side, the, the lowest ridge was disconnected from the trunk. So I quickly drew that. Then I reached under my, my leg and I unfolded what he had done, and it was the exact same thing right down to the disconnection between the trunk and the first uh, ridge on that, uh, on that Christmas tree. You, can't, you, you cannot use magic for that. Now, yeah. <laughs> did, Uri, did Uri Geller at, uh, at, at times... Uh, I don't know if it at times when things when the force wasn't there or whatever because you can't really control this stuff uh, yeah, that he may have done some stuff I I don't know he was a showman he made money from it still makes money from it and, and you know and I don't think that's laudable but uh, uh, during that same 
session with Geller, while we were talking, all of a sudden there was this loud bang in his uh, living room, and we looked over to the far corner. A, a rock had flown into the into the room and smashed into this beautiful wood chessboard he had, um, and it looked like an antique or it looked pretty exotic. And he starts yelling, "You see what I mean? Nobody believes this stuff. You see what I mean?" And I walked over, and I it, this rock looked like it was porous. It looked like merely a meteorite. Um, and here's this chessboard. Now, first of all, uh, would why at the time I was a newspaper reporter working in Niagara County, New York? Why would this famous guy in the Upper East Side of New York? Uh, sacrifice a, a very expensive chessboard for, to fool me. Uh, and uh, so we went over there. He, he's, it, and, and I said to him, I said, uh, I'm sorry, but can I, can I search your apartment? I wanted to see. He couldn't have thrown it. He, we were sitting. It, there's no way he could have thrown it. And it obviously came stri- from straight above the chessboard. And we were way across the room. And I'm staring at him. I was talking to him when it occurred. Uh, so I, I said, I, you know, I need to search your room. I was looking for an accomplice. I, I checked his closets. I checked underneath everything. There was no one else there. So, uh, you know, uh, there have been thousands of cases with Geller of things like that uh, occurring, in, including in front, of, uh, in, in front of some major scientists and, and in front of people like, I believe, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, you know, who walked on the moon. Great stuff. Fantastic stories. And hey, folks, if you love stories, Pluto TV has something great for you. They're the leading free streaming television service. You can watch over 100 TV channels and thousands of movies all on demand. And the best part, they're all free. No credit card needed. No sign up. Pluto TV is the easy and completely legal way to watch your favorite TV shows and hit movies. What are you waiting for? Never pay for TV again. Download Pluto TV for free on all of your favorite devices. Your phone, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Smart TV, PlayStation, heck, anywhere you can stream, you can get the best. Get yourself Pluto TV and never miss another exciting moment of free TV and free movies. 60 seconds. That's exactly how long this commercial lasts. Well, it's how long it's supposed to last. Sometimes I wander and start to ramble. Tim can attest to that. And mm. God, you never know what could happen to me. We could be talking cars one minute, ghosts the next, and Bigfoot encounters. But I digress. You know what else you can do in about a minute? Well, you can get an offer for your car with True Car. That's right. In the amount of time it takes to floss your teeth, pet your dog, do a few sit-ups, or just listen to my voice. You can get a True Cash offer. Best of all, you can do it from your smartphone or from home. Just go to True Car. Simply enter your license plate number and watch how your car's details begin to pile up. Answer a few questions, and you'll get an accurate True Cash offer from a local True Car certified dealer. It's that easy. After that, you can bring your car in. They'll check it out with you together. You can ask questions and get the answers you need, so there's no surprises. Then simply leave with your check or trade in your car for a brand new ride. So when you're ready to experience a better way to sell or trade in your car, check out True Car today. We're back. Michael Brown, our guest. These are really bizarre, strange tales we're hearing, and I love the insights you're giving us, Michael, stories that we've never heard before, and especially in uh, investigating the claims of Uri Geller and being there as a firsthand account eyewitness. Again, a lot of people will say he's very intelligent, he's adept at trickery and uh, chicanery, so maybe he was able to trick you and fool you on some of these aspects, but you got up. You didn't just sit there and, wow, that was weird, and, and report on it. You started looking for a plausible explanation for what these occurrences could have, uh, could have happened with. That's right. And, 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 you know, how about that fracture surface with the incipient melting? And yeah, that's crazy. Effects? And, yeah. And there's, there's, there's much more than that. I mean, there are uh, Geller as well as other, uh, after when Uri Geller started appearing on TV, there thousands and thousands of people, especially in the UK, 
uh, when they would watch TV, would report that cutlery in their home, silverware, would bend and curl and everything like he was doing on TV. And there was a spate of uh, spoon benders, especially kids, who suddenly could do the same thing Geller could do after watching him on TV. But the thing is, um, now certainly hundreds of kids are not master magicians. But uh, and they, they were studied by scientists in many cases. That some of these people could bend an object that was in a glass tube. In other words, they couldn't even be tu- they weren't even touching it. Um, and again, this gets it, this gets very difficult to explain in in uh, in physical in physical terms. Um, I interviewed a. Uh, an Oxford magician, uh, mathematician in Toronto who had turned into a parapsychologist, and they were studying uh, ways that, of, of trying to learn to create psychokinetic effects, and, and this, they had learned to make rapping sounds in wood and so forth. They, he felt it was just the power of the mind, not a, not a supernatural thing. But I'd like to make a point with all of this. I mean, I... I, I I did stories on random event generators for like the Atlantic Monthly and Reader's Digest and so forth, real scientific stuff. Um, But I'd like to make a point about the spiritual side of it. Uh, This one fellow we were studying in in uh, in upstate New York, his he who raised the tables and so forth, he had been uh, kicked out of being a teacher at the local school because they claimed he was in league with the devil. And at the time, I thought that was absurd. But at any rate, he did have, he had psychic abilities. I mean, like, when, when I met him, uh, he said, well, I can find objects if you hide them. And I said, like what? He says, well, uh, hide what you want. And I said, okay, I'm going to hide my college uh, ring, Fordham University. And, and I had my friend walk him down the, to the end of the block and I watched him. And then it, I was in the house and I hid my, my ring in his cupboard in the back and uh, underneath these tea bags. And he came, when he came in the house, he went directly for it. He found it in like, I don't know, less than a minute, uh, probably less than 30 seconds. And he did this repeatedly, including when I brought in two magicians to witness it. They, they were totally baffled by what he did, including the, the way that the table would rise when he put his hands on it. You could press down on a table and it would come bounding back up as if you were trying to press down a beach ball in water. Uh, this is the fellow I brought to Kent State University's physics uh, 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 hall, uh, Smith Hall of Physics. Uh, and at any rate, I thought it was just the power, power of the mind. But come to find out that he also went into trances. And when he did a spirit would speak uh, through him, had a, had a name and everything else. Uh, his voice would change, would deepen, uh, uh, would deepen quite radically. And, it, and strange things would occur. Like uh, when we, we first tried to tape it, at the minute that this voice came through, the tape recorder went off. So the next time I figured, oh, okay, I'll bring two tape recorders. So we started two tape recorders. Both went off uh, simultaneously. And so we never got it on, on tape. Uh, that's really hard to explain in normal rationalistic terms. Um, and one of his neighbors told me how he'd be passing by this fellow's house and just hear these smashing noises and everything in the house when, he, when the psychic was away. Uh, poltergeist activity. So um, you've got to be careful because I thought it was just the power of the mind. But when it, in, in his case, I think uh, certainly it was a, a spirit involved also, or primarily. That's, uh, that's astounding. I, I, I know you've got a lot of other stories to cover as we're going to go through this, and I'm, I'm certainly interested. Again, I want to mention the name of the book, Lying Wonders, Strangest Things. Before we go into the uh, bottom of the hour break here, explain to me the, the title of the book, Lying Wonders, Strangest Things. Well, uh, strangest things, of course, because there is, uh, is more than 60 short chapters. I hope each one extremely engaging on, on the, the most bizarre phenomena uh, that I 
could find readily uh, around the world, uh, some of which I was uh, directly involved with. And uh, the Lion Wonders is, is, comes from Thessalonians uh, in, in the Bible and also relates to what we're talking about uh, on how spirits can come and masquerade, you know, so um, as, as a lying wonder, which is warned about uh, in the Bible. So, you know, I don't want to get real uh, preachy about it, but I, I, I just hope people keep a prudent distance from some of this stuff. Uh, take it from a person who learned the hard way. Let's do this. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll continue with more unusual stories he's collected for his new book, more unusual experiences he's had. Stay tuned. We've got a lot coming your way right here on The Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. I'm Dave Schrader. This is Beyond the Darkness. Want a podcast? Got a podcast? Then check out Launchpad DM, powered by Podcast One. Launchpad DM is a totally free platform and service for anyone who wants to podcast, offering unlimited hosting and access to a dashboard with all of your show's analytics. You own and control everything, including subscribers. And it's a great discovery tool to help people find your podcast. You may even get invited to join the official Podcast One roster with even more perks like access to producers, marketers, sales teams, and more. Sign up today at launchpaddm.com. Beyond the Darkness. Welcome back to the program. Our guest tonight, Michael Brown, Lying Wonders, Strangest Things. That's the new book. We have a link up for that on today's program and a link to Michael's website so you can uh, follow along with him uh, and all of the uh, work and research and news stories that he posts and uh, shares as well. Let's, you know, in in the blurb on your book, it talks about uh, one of the strange stories, a boy that disappears into thin air time and time again. That was one of the stories I wanted to dig a little deeper into if you wouldn't mind sharing the story of that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's about as bizarre as it gets when it comes to somebody who is uh, haunted or possessed, uh, however you want to uh, label it. That was a, uh, a kid named Cornelio Closa, um, and it was in the Philippines in 1952. As a schoolboy, he was walking home with a friend, and uh, he he told his friend that he could see this beautiful young lady across this field and his friend couldn't say anything but he ran up to where he claimed to see this apparition and he was there for a while and they came back and soon after that uh cornelio's um his, his personage his personality shifted and then shifted very radically it changed he transformed into from a, a, a rather mild-mannered kid to a very hostile boy, uh, getting into fights constantly, causing all kinds of trouble at school. Um, and in fact, uh, then this phenomenon began to occur that uh, I, I personally had not heard about before. And that's according to some very credible witnesses. He would on occasion just disappear in front of people's eyes. He'd be in front of his parents his siblings, he, he, he disappeared in front of his entire classroom, including the teacher, just was standing there and then gone. And he'd be gone sometimes for minutes, sometimes for hours. And he said he would come back and, and he would say that that woman had, had taken him on a, on a trip. Um, well, anyway, obviously this frightened his parents. I mean, this went on for, I think, the better part of a year along with other phenomena that you hear about in cases of possession. Well, they finally took him to this uh, evangelical-type service. And in the, in the course of this service, um, all of, he saw this apparition of this woman again. But now 
she transformed from that beautiful woman into this terrible, ugly beast. And I guess he, he got scared. He realized what was going on. And, and they, uh, and it was the beginning of his, what they would call deliverance, but, uh, pretty bizarre stuff when somebody actually vanishes in front of your eyes. And I think really it's not so much vanishing, uh, although they can, you know, these spirits can cause teleportation effects, but it, but more likely it's simply a spirit shielding him from physical visual view from optical uh, view because that that can that can certainly happen and is in the and is in the literature of mystical theology how long did this go on for this kid uh, and you know i mean what there has to have been some major um investigation that went on with that well only uh, major only in the sense of uh, of trying to call in uh, ministers and so forth. Uh, I think they had a psychologist involved. I'm not not uh, exactly sure on that. But uh, as I recall, it went on uh, just about a year, and it was uh, it was torture for his parents. They they nailed down the windows in the house. They they forced him to stay in one room, and yet he would disappear from the house. He'd be gone, and and no sign of of uh, of anything disrupted doorways. Um, windows, nothing. He'd just be gone, and then he'd show up later. So, when I, you know, uh, and and like I said, besides that, he was. I think he bit his. He was biting students and his teacher, and you know, he he had. He was possessed. It was a case for an exorcist, but uh, no exorcist was immediately available until until later on. But yeah, very. There, you get some strange stories from the Philippines. There was another case in the Philippines, actually. My wife just sent me a new story on it. They're, they're going to be making a movie about her. Her name was Clarita in the Philippines. I have a chapter about her in the book. She was afflicted by some kind of an entity that was uh, cause, causing these deep, or two entities actually, these deep uh, fang marks in her neck and uh, on her back and, and scratch mark, claw marks. And I mean, you know, you can accuse a person of a lot of trickery, but try biting yourself in your lower back. Try uh, try to bite yourself in the back. And she had bites up and down her back, deep. Um, finally, in that case, again, in, uh, in, in this case, a minister, the archdiocese the, the, did not want to handle it. They felt it was too dangerous because two people died. It, they, they imprisoned this, this girl. They put her in prison because she was just wild. And uh, she had been on a street as a uh, prostitute at a very young age because she was homeless for reasons I, I can't recall just, just now. But they put her, they put her in, a, in, a, in a jail there in Manila, and she just caused such upheaval there. At, at one point, this, uh, the voice came out of her, a you know, hideous voice came out of her, and threatened this doctor who was trying to help her that it was going to kill him. The doctor died the next day of, uh, for, for reasons that remain obscure. Holy cow. Then, uh, not, not too long afterwards, she got into a, a rift with, uh, with one of the uh, prison officials, and he shouted at her, um, and insulted her and so forth. And once again, the voice came out, threatened his life, and he died immediately afterwards. So the archdiocese, and this is all in the newspapers. This was being covered in the regular daily newspapers when it was going on. There's pictures of it online. You know, if you want to look up Clarita, Philippines, uh, Fang Marks, or whatever. And I. And they're making, like I said, they're making a movie about it right now. But eventually, this evangelical came in, this minister, and rather quickly dispensed of the spirit that was possessing this this poor kid. So uh, you get some strange stories out of the Philippines. Yeah, it sounds like you do. Uh, Very, very unusual. Were there ever... um... Any of these stories that as you were researching them and investigating, you ever felt like maybe you were in over your head, you were up against something um, that could harm you or your loved ones potentially long-term? 
Yes. I think that uh, not from the standpoint I come, I come from now, because, look, let me, let me be straightforward with you. I come from a Christian standpoint now. I've, I, I came the hard way, but that's, the stand, that's my perspective now. But I believe that if you're going into this in a, in a straightforward, secular way, without proper protection, that you can be mightily harmed by these things. Uh, I, if you'll allow an editorial, I'll, I'll, I'll tell Please. you that I think... Well, I think there's a connection between all these type things. I think there's a connection between the type of phenomena we've been talking about with psychics and haunted houses, between that and curses, cars that historically have been cursed, or mummy curses and all that, that there's links between that and the you know, Mothman in West Virginia, Loch Ness Monster, these so-called creatures, uh, whether they're werewolves elsewhere, whether they're yetis, abominable snowmen, skunk ape in Florida, uh, Bigfoot in the Northwest, uh, UFOs, aliens, greys, insectoids, reptilians, whatever you want to put out there, and especially alien abductions. I think that they're all uh, that that they're all spiritually linked. I think that they're all spiritual deceptions, uh, or at least most of them. I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, uh, dare sit here and say there can't be some type of a cryptid, some type of a creature that has survived without anyone noticing. Although it's pretty unlikely these days with the population. Uh, nor would I sit here and tell you that the Earth was definitely has not been visited by other planets because you know what 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 do they estimate a billion galaxies a trillion stars it, and they can't really estimate um so i'm not going to say that but i think that in the majority of cases of let's take ufos ufo abductions they're very very similar to cases you see in parapsychology to cases you see in the occult to cases you see in possession haunted houses and so forth in fact um in 1947, before Roswell, the real famous, the first famous flying saucer case in 1947, in June of that year, was, was uh, early July, was Kenneth uh, Arnold. And he was a pilot, very reputable, um, actually was a, a, a politician, a businessman, so forth, and, and he, he was an amateur pilot. He was flying over Mount Rainier and spotted these nine objects going at, at a, what he estimated was about 1,800 miles an hour. He described them and made headlines all around the country. He's the one, it, it was from him that they coined the expression flying saucer. He didn't say that the objects looked like flying saucers. He said that they were moving like a saucer if you threw it across the surface of water. And then the newspaper picked up on that. But at any, my point with Kenneth Arnold is that, uh, a, that first of all, he was flying over Mount Rainier, which is also known for occult-type things down there on the surface and for sightings of Bigfoot. Later on, Kenneth Arnold reported seeing UFO-type orbs of light in his house. And, you know... Uh, why would extraterrestrials be whizzing around the inside of this house little, as little orbs? Uh, I think it's a classic case of, of spirits. You know, spirits can appear any way they want, um, and they do appear any way they want. They're, that's why I call it lying wonders. They're, they can be extremely deceptive, and you have to be careful because they can come to you as nice, nice, your, your grandmother who died, and you know, they, uh, they can infiltrate dreams. They can uh, do a lot of things to, as you pointed out, ensnare a person. So um, you have to be uh, cautious of that, uh, of that deceptive side. But I'm saying that I, I believe there's a common link between much of this phenomena. And, you know, David, for no, no other reason, if we're with all of these UFO sightings, and what this one scientist astronomer estimates that more than a million uh, where's the physical evidence? I mean, I want to see it. Where is it? Has it been put under a microscope? Where is it? Since the 1940s, the government's been testing it. And I believe that the reason that presidents who promise to get to the bottom of it can't get to the bottom of it is because no one 
ever has gotten to the bottom of it. It's a spiritual, ethereal, ephemeral, deceptive type uh, 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 phenomenon going on here. And Right. As a matter of fact, we just the- reported yesterday, Bernie Sanders has promised uh, to you know, release disclosure if he becomes president. And I think every president has, has admitted that they will come forward with what they find, and every one of them seems to get shut down. That's right. Uh, Ronald Reagan saw one himself, so did Jimmy Carter. Maybe you've reported on that already. Uh, Jimmy Carter watched one with a, a group from his church for, right. I think, 15, 15 minutes. Um, so they, they, they've even seen them. Um, and, you know, the same thing with Area 51 and all of these, these, uh, these mysteries. All of these sightings, where is the, where's the evidence? Just one piece from from the sightings, from these alleged crashes. I recently visited an alleged uh, crash site in southern Missouri. It's, it's known as MO41 because in 1941, this is years, six years before Roswell, uh, a flying saucer supposedly crashed just south of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, southeastern part of the state. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I went to, no one knows exactly where, but uh, uh, one of the ways that this this account came down is a, they had called the police and firemen had called a uh, local preacher to come and do last rites because there was a crash and there were bodies. Well, he claimed later, he only he only talked about it once to his immediate family, and he said, this is the last first and last time I'll talk about this, because the military swooped right in. He And he claims just, you know, warned everyone not to talk about it. But he um, he said he saw the craft. Uh, there were three uh, aliens, uh, or, or what he thought were aliens, the, the, the grays, you know, the short entities. One was still gasping, he thought. But at any rate, with all these crashes like what he described and described at Roswell and described uh, on the plain of uh, San Augustine in, uh, in New Mexico and elsewhere in Russia and in, in Africa and so forth, South Africa, where's the evidence in, in Rendlesham? Why is it in Rendlesham Forest in England where at more than 20 military types directly were direct eyewitnesses to a, a light that descended and uh, for an extended period of time in the course of several nights, and they went right up to it. Um, again, again, why with all of these sightings and so forth don't we have any tangible evidence? And why is it that you get the same after effects, that people who have alien encounters will smell sulfur, brimstone, which is classic in cases of demons and possession. And the same thing occurs at Loch Ness. The same thing occurs with, with Mothman in West Virginia and all of these other cryptids and so forth. How could it be that there are an estimated 300 lakes just in North America that have strange, unexplained creatures, and yet we don't have one carcass? So I think, it's a, I think there are spiritual links And I I think that there are intelligences, super intelligences in the spiritual realm that can project anything they want to us, and and they do. Do you, um, and and I get that concept, something is projecting, something is giving this, is it it to uh, lead us astray from religion, or is it to cause dissension amongst one another so that there is a constant rift between people. Well, I think it can certainly do both of those. Um, it can also simply attach, attach to you, uh, looking to attach itself to you and, and draw uh, energy, just cause disruption. Uh, uh, these are, uh, can be very hostile entities that their only pleasure is causing pain to, to others, including humans. And so they're looking to attach themselves to you, to your situation, and, and, uh, and they do. I, I would, you know, I know I can't get through to uh, a lot of people who are invested in, in a new age and so forth. But I, I just say, just be cautious, step back, you know, don't move too fast into this realm. I did. 
and I paid for it. All right. Now, as we continue to uh, uh, go through these strange encounters and bizarre stories, again, the book is called Lying Wonders, Strangest Things. Michael Brown, our guest and the author of that book. Uh, I know that you talk about curses and are there curses that changed history? What can you tell us about that? Curses are something we're always fascinated in in digging into. It sounds so ludicrous in one sense, but uh, terrifying in the next. Yeah, and and you know, there's so many cases of that. You have, uh, you know, you have. I, I mentioned like mummy curses, and uh, some people used to used to believe that uh, that the Titanic had a mummy on board. Although I don't think that's uh, true. I think that's that's a myth. But um, you know, there there are, are folks who, uh, throughout all of history, who have claimed that, that that they've been affected by like King Tut's uh, tomb. There is also a uh, case that I write about that occurred. Uh, some people think it started uh, World War One, when a uh, an archduke was assassinated, and and this, his car, the car he was riding in when he was assassinated. Uh, Archduke Ferdinand, when he was assa- uh, assassinated, was said to have been cursed. And then afterwards, um, after he died, and it was his assassination that set off World War I in Sarajevo, um, after, after his assassination and, and, uh, and the car was you know, put in the hands of other people, um, they, they died sooner than they should have. They had inexplicable things happen to them. Uh, a series of unfortunate events, I guess you could say. So I believe there's no question that there's, that there are cases where curses, uh, operate. I, we see a lot of, uh, Bigfoot and, and animal mutilations, UFO sightings, missing times, strange disappearances, all these, all these type things around Indian burial mounds. Um, and in some cases it might be because there are curses at work there. So, um, you know, there, there was a Siberian mummy that some people think affected, uh, Hillary Clinton. She, she visited it when she was on a trip to what? the, uh, the, the former Soviet Union. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And I, I have it in a book. Um, I get into the, uh, into the details of it in, in the book, but, uh, uh, I don't know if it's true, you know, if he had any curse from that, but uh, I call it the chapter "Mummies the Curse" because, you know, that was that was the claim with this. Um, so I, I I think yes, I think that there there are cases that are true. I don't know if it like you take James Dean, the famous uh, actor. He had a Porsche five uh, five fifty Spider, you know. He used to race it, and uh, that that. That car uh, killed him. He, he got in a crash with it. And then later on, when uh, you know uh, uh, the car was purchased by somebody else, I think it was a doctor. Um, first of all, Dean's companion, who was a German mechanic uh, who survived the crash, he died in a second very similar accident soon after. When a man named uh, George Barris bought that spider, it immediately slipped off a trailer and broke a mechanic's leg. Not long after that, parts from the car, the engine, the drivetrain, they were sold, and uh, none of the parts boated very well. I mean, there was one guy who uh, who was in a vehicle powered by the engine of Dean's car, and he lost control during a race and hit a tree and was killed instantly. A second guy bought that same drivetrain, uh, and, uh, and uh, he was injured uh, severely when his car suddenly locked up and rolled over. Um, and it goes on. Tires from the from Dean's car blew out simultaneously, and so forth. So, um, finally, the the uh, I think it was the California Highway Patrol uh, prevailed upon upon people to look. Just put this car in a safety exhibit, and that'll be the end of it. And it was the end of it. Right, but I mean, where true, where would true the story. Curse have come? Yeah, I know it's it's a creepy one. We talk about in our our uh, cursed Hollywood uh, presentations that uh, Tim and I do. Um, but do you have any aspect? Where did the curse begin? What was that first spark? Well, it it you know it could have been it could have started with something that attached itself to Dean. 
I don't know what he was doing in his in his in his own personal life. I don't know if there was any occult involvements. You know, people in Hollywood they mess around with all kinds of uh, things they think are the latest trend and and that are cool to do. I I uh, I don't know it, and or it could have been a problem with the car when he when he purchased it. But um, objects can carry. Uh, you know, an entity. They, uh, an entity can be attached to them. You find this constantly with antique dealers. Uh, I have communicated with an, a, one antique dealer in all kinds of accounts. Uh, another woman wrote me um, for our website there, for Spirit Daily. She wrote me this long, involved account of what happened to this house she lives in near Lowell, Massachusetts, that had been owned by a sea captain. And just the ex- Extraordinary phenomena in the house, and um, and with and uh, with this one bed in uh, in her son's bedroom. Her son became deathly ill until they got rid of the bed. So these things can uh, you can call it a cursed bed, I guess, or else you can just call it a haunted bed. I don't know which, but I have no clue as to what happened in the case of uh, of Dean. That uh, that's a weird one with the the bed and and the family. You know, cursed objects, possessed possessions, I think they call them. Yeah, those are stories that, uh, you know, we've covered throughout the years on the show. And it is bizarre how that energy does seem to affect and impact certain things. But then there are others, you know, that spend a lifetime collecting antiques and have absolutely nothing happen. That's right. That's right. That's, uh, there's not too much that's predictable about the paranormal realm, except that it's unpredictable. Um, it's It's operating at a level we're not used to in, in realities that we have not yet encountered. We can't see into these realms. We're wearing spiritual blinders. And, uh, and I, I believe, frankly, that, that uh, there are, we're going to find out one day when we're on the other side looking back that, that uh, there were just spirits all over the place, good, bad, angels, not angels, <laughs> And uh, uh, deceased, as as well as spirits from the dark side and from heaven and so forth, if uh, if you will. Uh, and that a lot of things that happen to us in our lives, a lot of our moods, a lot of our problems, a lot of our, our successes, were because of an interaction that we didn't realize with these forces that swirl around us, come in and out of our lives and affect us. And I think that it behooves us to make sure that what's affecting us is a is a bright uh, entity and an an angelic one, and not something that's that's coming from the wrong side, and that that is going to deceive us and is going to cause a lot of uh, misery. You know these things they they like to create dissension. They like to create fights. If you walk in a, you know how it is sometimes. You're in a great mood. All of a sudden you're in the presence of somebody, and your mood just drops. Right. Or or all of a sudden. You're at this, there's this flashpoint, and, and, and there's anger, and there's a fight right out of the blue. You know, uh, These things can be caused by entities. Entities love to cause anger because they feed off that energy. They love to cause fright. They want to scare you. That's why they make noises at night and do all these other things. Because when you're afraid, you're, you're exuding, emanating, radiating, whatever you want to use as a term, energy. And that in, it somehow empowers them because, uh, you know, they don't have access to it like they did when they were in the physical, if they're discarnate souls. So this is just my conjecture. This is what I've observed through, you know, since the, the 1970s when I started looking at uh, haunted houses. I think it's extremely dangerous for the Zach Bagans to have this museum in Las uh, Vegas with all of these artifacts from Charles Manson, from haunted houses, this one, he had to get rid of a rocking chair recently. Did you read about that? Because right. from it, the, uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren museum. Yeah. Because, because people were falling uh, ill around it and so forth. It's, so many bad things were occurring. 
Um, now, you don't think that that might just be some P.T. Barnum? That might be a little bit of, oh, somebody you know, talked about having a headache and not feeling well, and they happened to come out of that room. That would make a great TMZ story. Let's really hype this up. Yeah, I think it can be. I think the, the same is true of those ghost hunter shows. Um, yeah, and, and uh, the same thing with Finding Bigfoot, you know. Uh, so yeah, I would agree with you. I, you can't believe every single, every s- single thing is a paranormal manifestation. Um, but uh, but paranormal manifestations there are, usually when we don't want them. But this guy's playing. He's playing with dangerous stuff. He bought Zach Bagans. I, again, I'm uh, I'm sure you know, but he bought that home in Gary, Indiana that was violently, violently haunted. I interviewed the the exorcist who had to be called in. He he described a lot of things to me, and so did medical personnel and police officers. I mean, the policemen, after a while, wouldn't go near the family living in a house because there were so many bad things happening to them, including all their electronics going out and, and just illnesses, and the, the, the people in the house were, were getting deathly ill and the noises. In one case, nurses in a hospital where one of the, there were a couple children in the house, where they were taken in the midst of this incredible uh, poltergeist eruption, taken to a hospital, the nuns testified, and this is in the Indianapolis Star newspaper, did a whole long investigation of this. The nurses testified that at one point, this one young boy who was in the house walked up a wall. The end was taken over by something and walked halfway up a wall. Didn't just like run up it and jump. He walked, uh, you know, up up the wall. And so that's certainly not anything that's very normal. Um, well, Zach Bagans, this um, P.T. Barnum of, of uh, the paranormal, he bought that house. And so he could film a documentary and his crew got all kinds of sick. They had tremendous dissension. There were unbelievable problems to the point where he had the place demolished. So I think some of it, yeah, they can be hyping it up. They can be exaggerating. They can be putting on an act uh, on these ghost shows and so forth. But there is something real behind a lot of it. And once more, they're playing with fire. Agreed. Now, let me um, ask you this. I know we were talking about some of the haunted items. You were talking about, uh, in, in the press release about the book, a doll that texts. What, uh, what's the story behind that? Well, I, I, I think we'd have to say uh, dolls in the plural because there are it, – it's, it, <laughs> it's why I call this book Strangest of All because there are, are cases where – Museums have dolls said to be haunted, and uh, one of them is in the Keys, is in Key West. One of them was in uh, in Canada. There was uh, I interviewed a curator at a museum, and uh, uh, and she was telling me about this when she went to take over the museum. She had heard stories. They they had an exhibit with a a doll that was said to be wanted, uh, that moved around, that would, would uh, be in one place than another, the head would turn and so forth. It sounds like something out of Rod Serling in a Twilight Zone. Um, but it, she told me that when she was starting the job, she, she uh, bought a new phone. No one had the, no one had yet, she hadn't given anyone the uh, number yet. And, and uh, as she was driving to start this job at the museum where this doll it's named Mandy. This was in uh, British Columbia. Um, named Mandy was. Um, she said she received a text, and and uh, uh, most of it was indecipherable. But there were letters and symbols, uh, and then it, the sign-off was an X, and then the, the name Mandy. So something texted her saying Mandy, even though nobody. Nobody at the, muse- the museum she was going to start a new job that had access to her telephone number, and that was the name of this uh, this doll. The one in, in Key West, I think, was called uh, 
I think it was uh, I think it was named uh, Robert, and and uh, that was uh, pretty weird too. Staffers at uh, at the Fort East uh, Martello Museum uh, is the name of it. They were um, they had taken over this this doll when people who purchased a house that had been owned by the person who owned the doll uh, gave it to the museum. They didn't want it because they they thought it wore a malevolent smirk and uh, and that it moved around when it couldn't be moving around. There was I think a workman in their attic who saw it move across the uh, the attic once they put it up there to get it out of their sight. Um, very unnerving. And when they brought it into the museum, um, what, what especially unnerved people was its, its comportment, its attitude. Staffers at the museum swore that the doll didn't like being moved and uh, it caused a stir any time they rotated it through exhibits. And a, a, a number of visitors, and again, I interviewed uh, the person in charge of the museum down there, and numerous visitors attested that the doll would turn its head to follow them as they were passing it. Um, and strange behavior, those who moved the doll would find unpleasant things happen to them. So um, that was finally, uh, I, I think it's, well, I don't know, I think it's still on exhibit. But I, I, again, once again, if anyone goes to Key West, I don't recommend visiting it or messing around with this stuff because whether or not it's a doll, we're, we're dealing with a spiritual realm. The idea that reincarnation exists, that, you know, uh, we've lived past lives, do you believe that this is also kind of a trick of, uh, you know, a, a form of deception, making us believe that, uh, you know, we have other chances? What, Where do you weigh in on this? Well, I remember that famous case of Bridie Murphy. I read when I was a young, young guy. And in other cases, too, I remember I was myself, uh, again, back in the days I was investigating, I went under hypnotic regression, past life stuff and everything. Uh, I don't believe in reincarnation. I do believe that people have supernatural recollections of other lifetimes, but that they're tapping into other the lifetimes of other people, either clairvoyantly or because the spirit of the person is, is, is feeding them knowledge or, or some type of preternatural entity is, is feeding them knowledge, uh, detailed knowledge of another person's life. This is why, again, we have to be so, so very cautious not to get wrapped up in things before we take a real good long look at things and do it from not just a skeptical standpoint, but from a spiritual standpoint. So uh, myself, um, I, 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 don't, I don't believe it exists. I, I did it one time. And I understand why people do, because some of these, these books are impressive. You know, I'm sure they'll hit. They'll, they'll be able to describe a ship that they were on that sunk in the 1800s and who was on it and what happened and, 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 and so forth, because it's true. But, you know, you can pick things up in the ether that are true and don't mean you were actually there in the physical. So, you know, be careful not to be deceived, not to encounter, again, what I call lying wonders. All right. We've uh, got up just a handful of minutes left here. What are a few of your other favorite stories that you put together in this book? Or if you have a few that you didn't put in the book uh, to leave some surprises, where would you like to go next? Well, you know, there are, there are some mysteries that that uh, I sit here today, and I don't know if they were supernatural or, or, or not. Um, I will tell you, I, I don't know if you want to hear one more thing that was uh, pretty strange about uh, about Uri Geller, um, or sure. if you're done with him for the day. <laughs> no, you could feel free if you want to wrap up with another uh, Uri Geller and another few stories. That's great. When they were studying Uri Geller in the 1970s, by the way, it was funded by the Central Intelligence Agency and the Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency. Okay, and there was there was even a, a there was a case um, there was a case worker who was assigned to the uh, to the to studying him. Anyway, uh, what happened this one time was really bizarre, right? the strangest of all, really, when it came to come comes to psychics. Um, 
there was a the physicist was Dr. Don Curtis in this case, and he 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 was at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. Dr. Curtis was involved with the testing of Geller, and he was he and his wife were relaxing one afternoon during the Geller investigation, when all of a sudden in their living room there was a hologram or an apparition, something materialized before their eyes in the middle of the living room. It it uh, it can only be described really as, as, as bizarre, macabre, whatever you want to say. It was, uh, they saw what looked like this artificial arm draped by a black suit sleeve, just rotating as if on a spit. Uh, instead of a hand, there was a hook at the end of it. Very, you know, very creepy, to say the least. Well, this caused, when they went back and told people, this really unnerved other scientists to, involved, and it infuriated this, uh, this guy named Dr. Kit Green. He was the CIA caseworker. And so he, he, he uh, met with two physicists involved, Dr. Hale Putoff and Dr. Russell Targ from Stanford Research Institute. And he demanded a meeting. They met at a uh, motel. He wanted to know what's going on, what's this crazy story about them seeing this, this arm with a hook uh, rotating in their living room and so forth. And while they were talking about it, he called it, uh, it, one of the scientists quoted Dr. Green as calling it, quote, bizarre nonsense, unquote. And of course, anyone, anyone would. But at one point when they were discussing this, um, there was a bang on the door. And it wasn't like a polite knocking. Uh, it was an insistent knock. It wasn't even an insistent knock. It was like somebody trying to barge in. And, uh, you know, they're sitting there stunned over this. They thought maybe they were ready to be robbed. This guy Green from the CIA, Dr. Green, he opened a door and with no words, no greeting, the short middle-aged guy comes in in a dark gray suit. He strides in uh, and he had an ashen complexion, they said, these scientists said, to match his suit. Um, he just walked slowly around, muttering a few words they couldn't really comprehend and uh, and and uh, left as quickly as he had, he had entered. But while he did, the those two scientists and the CIA official noticed that one of his suit sleeves was pinned up. He was missing an arm. The sleeve was empty. This, you know, so we think back at uh, you know that arm that was rotating as if on a spit. This creepy stuff. Now this was in association with Uri Geller. That's why I say. It's not just power of the mind. It's not just psychic energy. That uh, you have to be careful. These things can go uh, a lot wilder and a lot deeper than that. Do you um, do you feel that by bringing this information out, sharing these stories, uh, do you worry that it's going to just uh, kind of entice people more into investigating the strange and supernatural, and they'll they'll glom onto the um, flash and dazzle of it and ignore the warning advice? Well, I certainly hope not. Uh, I, I, I pray not. Same thing with shows like this, you know, talking about it and so forth. Um, you know, I, I hope that these warnings are, are heated. You can't really, can't really do much when they aren't, I, you know, and I, I wanted to present a book that had interesting stories that also subtly had had messages to them and, and subtly had warnings. I don't preach in this book, but I think anyone with eyes to see and ears to hear can see the connections between many of these these uh, stories. And I and I just hope that they exercise prudence because um, because prudence is is extremely necessary in this realm. I appreciate that and uh, love the stories that you've had to share with us. And I hope you'll come back in the future when you have another book come out. I'm guessing you're already hard at work on uh, on the next one. Not quite yet, no, because we have this daily website, like I said, spiritdaily.com, like a like a daily newspaper, and and so I work at that every day. I am doing a magazine story on on. Uh, this, on UFOs right now, I'm going to be submitting to a major magazine. We'll see where it goes. And uh, discussing it from more of an intellectual standpoint, I'm not getting into any of these aspects, no paranormal aspects. It, it's strictly from the, you know, from a uh, kind of scientific viewpoint. 
Excellent. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. The book, again, we have a link up for it, and uh, it's right on our page today, so you can find it. Uh, order it. And please do me a favor, folks. When you order the book, Lying Wonders, Strangest Things, uh, make sure that you rate and review the books, because that does help all of our authors uh, to keep their books up in the realms and, and show the popularity of these styles of uh, writings. So make sure you go rate and review. We will be back again next week with more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio, plus an interview from the new TV show Ghost Hunters on A&E, which begins airing on uh, the 21st. We will be talking with uh, two new members of that TV series. Make sure you tune in. Plus, next Saturday, more Supernatural News and Parashare here on the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness.